begin. Good afternoon. We are interviewing Mr. Robert Donald Scott, better known as Don Scott or Scotty. We're here at the Morse Institute Library in Natick, Massachusetts. This is Wednesday, June 10th, 1998. Hi, Don. How are you? I'm just fine. Very good. Could we ask you, please, what your current age is? Um, 68. 68. Well, 68 in July. And your current resident, where you're living? I live in Upton, Maine. Upton, Maine. And you are a widower? Yep. And how many children do you have? Four. Four children, and how many grandchildren? Two. Boy and, and a girl. What was your wife's name? Rosemary. Rosemary. Um, Dawn, where were you born? South Natick, Glenham Moss Hospital. And how long did you live in Natick? I'm still here. <laughs> Well, I moved out of Natick in uh, 81. I moved to Maine, and uh, the wife and I were back and forth. There was no permanent. If you want to see the grandchildren every other week or so, we'd be come down for a week. We'd go back up home for a week. When you were growing up in Natick, what was it like as compared to today? Well, I am not too familiar with, like, North Natick or West Natick. I never did because I always rode a bicycle and I had a fish pole. And South Natick has done a 360, as far as I'm concerned. We used to roam over everybody's property to go fishing, nobody ever said a word. Was it more of a farmland back then in yep. South Natick? I can remember my grandfather on Water Street having a dozen chickens, two or three pigs, a cow, and a goat. People across the street had a couple of sheep. We, there was, you know, everybody had little food, little, a few animals that slaughter in the fall, that eat them all winter. So did you mostly stay in the South Natick area, not traveling too far out of that area? I stayed, well, I stayed in South Natick pretty much so until I got a driver's license. Mm -hmm. And you went to Natick High School? Nope. Did you go to high school? Nope. So how, mu how much education did you have? Uh, I went to seventh grade Coolidge. And then I thought I knew more than the teachers, <laughs> so I quit. And my father talked me into going to Newton Trade School for two years. Newton Trade? Yep. Mm -hmm. And then where? And I took up welding and machinist. And did you have a business, or did you work with a company back then? Uh, as soon as I got out of school, I worked with D.M. Bernardi and Wellesley in construction. And how old were you then? Uh, 17, 18, something like that. Did you have brothers and sisters? I have one brother. And did he go through school? Yep. In Natick? Yep. And then what did he do for business, or did he, he go to school? He has done, you name it, I think he's done it. And what is his name? Uh, George Bertram, George B. Scott. He don't like Bertram too well, I don't think. I don't either, but anyhow, my mother thought it was great. And your dad, what did he do? My father died five years ago. At what age? It's almost 80, I believe. He was a policeman here for 21, 22 years. He was a police officer. Yeah. Then had a heart attack, retired, and he moved to Maine, Steuben, on and the seacoast. What was his first name? George. George. And your mom was a housewife? Yeah, that, and she uh, was a waitress at Wellesley College for a long time when I was a lot smaller. When did you, or did you decide on your own to enter the military? Yep. At what age? Uh, 17, I think it was 18, 18. I had already been in the National Guard for a couple of years. And uh, my three year term, the National Guard got through it, what was it, like 20, something like that. Then I went in the military, in the army. And where were you stationed initially when you went into the army? Uh, I was shipped to Fort Devens, and that was a processing depot. They sent me down to Camp Pickett, Virginia, which is now Fort Pickett, Virginia, which is now Fort Pickett National Guard. The Army gave it to the National Guard a year ago. Mm -hmm. So you were a little over 20, yeah. and you went into the Army. Did you have friends that went in with you? No. So you went by yourself. Yeah. 
Was that difficult, leaving Natick, leaving South Natick? No, not really. It was exciting because I never had left South Natick really to speak of. Mm -hmm. So it was quite a, an affair, you know, I thought I was something new every day. I found somebody new every day. And at first, for a long time, I enjoyed it because I was going here and going there. I was seeing half the world, well, it's part of the East Coast anyhow. I, and at that time, was the U.S. in war? Yeah. World War II? No, World Korean War. In the Korean War, I'm sorry. Yeah, World War II ended in 45. 45, my era. Um, basic training was at... Camp Fort Pickett. Pickett, Camp Pickett. What was that like on a, on well, a which, regular day? Uh, I spent eight weeks as a cook and baker school. All right? No problems. So then I was reassigned to a tank company where they didn't have any cooking equipment. And were you supposed to do the cooking? No, not when I was reassigned to the tank company. I was, uh, I did general maintenance. I was, of course, in the tank company, you learned to do all, f in those days, was five positions in a tank. And you learned to do all five of them. Did you establish close relationships with the people that you were working with at that time? There was a couple I did, yes. But the majority of them, no. And were they all around your age? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you were reassigned to a tank company still at Camp Pickett. Yeah, 325th Tank Battalion. And we were what you call a bitch outfit. And explain Because we that. floated. Anybody needed uh, tank support for, make, for maneuvers or something? Away we go. What did you like about your duties back then at that age? It was exciting. Like I said, for, it was something new I've never seen before. I never knew what an army tank was like. And I enjoyed it to a great extent. Mm -hmm. The part I didn't like was we'd come in off the range Friday night and there'd be a hundred tanks and a half a dozen garden hoses going and we'd have to wash the tanks down. Well, if you were the last one in line, you could sock it about two to three o'clock in the morning. Then it was kind of late to go out the next that night because there was no passes after midnight then. And then you'd have to get up early the next morning? Every morning, mm -hmm. six, 5.30, 6 o'clock. If you got in at 4, it was still up at between 5.30 and 6. And how did your duties change throughout your military? How long were you in the service? I went in in September, no, November 3rd, and I got out November 2nd. I went in in 50 and got out in 53. So three years. Yep. I have also four years of National Guard time too. The few before and then after? Two before and one after. Um, how did your duties change after f Camp Pickett? Were you sent overseas? No, we were sent down to Camp Irwin, California, outside of Barstow. And being a tank outfit in the desert, we took desert warfare. And I stayed there, I don't know, something like seven or eight months. And they were preparing you for going overseas? Well, I guess so. That was a matter of fact, make you step into the service to prepare you to go somewhere. Because mm -hmm. there's always somewhere they can ship you. And did they ship you? I got July, August. I got my first set of papers saying I was going overseas. They gave me 10 days leave. And I don't know, it was about the 8th, say the 15th of September, I left to go overseas. September 15th of? Somewhere in that area. Was that 51? Yeah. And did you know where you were going? Yeah, Korea. And says you, right on, says right on your papers where you're going to go, but uh, the assignment to which you're going to get when you get there is something else again. So when they told you, or when you got your assignment to go to Korea, were you prepared for what type of atmosphere you would be involved with, whether it be mm. the weather or the, uh, the cultural differences? I was prepared because a New Englander can travel anywhere in the world and be comfortable because of the kind of weather we have. The Army realizes this and, and they've, they've said it on several occasions. But when you come out of the desert 
at 100 degrees and all of a sudden you wind up in career at 10 and 15 below. There's a minor change there and you've got to get used to it. And what about some of your other Army buddies who maybe weren't New Englanders? Did they have a difficult time more well, so than you? We had one young fellow from Florida and he wound up in Korea, four feet of snow, and he had a ball. He had never made a snowball in his life. <laughs> he rolled in it, he played in it, he thought the stuff was great. Well, I had other ideas, but anyhow, he enjoyed it for about a month. Then he got a little used to it, and he kind of slowed down, calmed down a little, but he enjoyed it. When you were sent over to Korea, what was your, what, what area were you first sent to? What town uh, or city? I left Seattle, Washington. I went into Pusan Harbor. And I said, oh boy, the war is 90 miles north of here. I'm in Pusan Harbor. I joy, they forgot to call my name. And they left me on the boat. I went right down around the bottom and up, went into Inchon. And I was in Inchon and I got, uh, I was what they call TDY. That's, you got to go with some outfit to go anywhere. So they assigned me to the second division, which was in career at the time. Then when I got over there, they put me in a big field. It was 2,000 of us, roughly, got off the boat. And we also had some around 1,500 Canadians with us, too. And what was that like, mingling with them? I know uh, I will be degraded for saying this, but they were a lot sharper than we were. Uh, they, their, how should I put it? Their training was a lot sharper than ours. Uh, we just took more like a general course. They were specialists in everything. And they showed some hand-to-hand -hand combat you know, among themselves practicing. Made our boys look sick. Because, you know, we took on a Canadian and they took one of us and we'd go back and forth just playing the board ship. And uh, we had no, we couldn't keep up with them. So Physically? They were better than we were too, I think. So they were better prepared. Did they have a longer training program than you had? I don't know exactly what the training program is, but I know it's a lot harder than ours. Mm -hmm. They don't have soft chairs to sit in, so they tell us. In those days, I mean, they were, it was a soldier's uh, living. I mean, they had nothing fancy, but they were well trained. Did you find that because of your lesser training that you had to be a quick learner? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, when I hit Korea, I, like I said, I got into that big field. And I was with the second division, and the sergeant says, everybody from here over there get on those trucks, from here to there get on those trucks. So I'm bouncing along the dirt road, and I says, Sergeant, I'm glad to be with the second division. He says, sir, you're not with the second division. I said, whoa, let me out, I'm on the wrong truck. He says, no. The cab just last night, the living hell pounded out of him, the first cavalry division. That's where you're going. You know, that really perks you up. So, Makes you feel good. So you initially thought you would be with the second yeah. division and then I have overnight, paperwork saying that I was assigned to them. And then overnight you were changed to the first cavalry yeah. because of their losses yeah. in battle. Yeah. Were you scared? Uh, mm. I, I, I really, I was so scared. I didn't know I was scared at times. It's, it's a funny feeling. And it's hard to talk about, it's, I don't have the right words for it. But it made you sit there and think, what in the hell am I getting into? Mm -hmm. So suddenly you're a, a young boy from a small town in New England, sent overseas with orders changing overnight. Yeah. And, and all you could do was follow the orders. Oh, yeah. They tell you that's it, you do it. And. My tank training of a little over a year went right down the drain. I never seen a tank over there except the ones that were stuck in the mud or the one that was blown up on the edge of the street. Tell us about the mud. Um, some of the research that we have here talks about not only the cold weather and problems that some servicemen had, mm -hmm. you stated you didn't because of your New England upbringing, but mud was a very, very severe problem over there, not only with equipment but with travel, correct? Yep. Uh, we hit, they were prepared. Our government 
downsized right after World War II, and they had no equipment in Korea to speak of. 90% of all our equipment came in out of Okinawa. And Okinawa isn't a place where it's cold. It's warm climate, I think, most of the year. And the first year, the boys were the first year, they had nothing. They had no clothing, no nothing. And a lot of them were frostbite after frostbite. I mean, it was horrible. And were, were you part of that, or did you come in after that and they had I clothed came in you? after that. And they clothed you properly? No, not properly, but we were a lot better than the first part of the war was started. A lot better. Was there a lot of complaining going on, or did you just know you had to take it? Talk to the side of that wall, and you get just as much. <laughs> you know, there's only so much they can do so fast. Sure. I mean, so, you try to get, where would you gather 20,000 overcoats in a hurry? It's a problem. They forgot about cold weather, and I mean, it wasn't, the weather was just cold here, but over there, it's either a rice paddy or a puddle. And the dampness is unbelievable. You dig a bunker, and the water would trickle down the wall. You dig a little trench, it'd run out into the, the low ground. During that time period, did you see a lot of the, the locals who, who lived and worked the paddies? No, did I did not see. This is the part that hurts me. I know nothing about the civilians, nothing, because they tried, uh, as you can see, some of the older movies. The bridges were overpacked with civilians going both directions. Well, they stopped that when they found they had a problem. And there was no civilians allowed within 10 miles of us. There was a big gap behind us. And anything in that big gap that was Asian was shot. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. they weren't supposed to be there, and they figured there was a lot of guerrilla warfare going behind us, and at times we didn't know whether we should fight that direction or this direction. It was a problem. There were so many guerrillas, infiltrators coming through our lines, it was horrible. For the first year, year and a half, they were everywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, anybody in that 10 mile strip, I had a houseboy though. It's the only thing, the only way I got acquainted with any of their whatever was through my little houseboy. And could he speak English? Very little. But my, I wrote home to my wife, and she sent over a first grade English little uh, book, Learn How to Read. Now, was she your wife when you went over? Were you married? Yes. You were I, married? I got married just before I left. You did. Yeah. That had to be difficult also. Yeah, yeah. Was your wife living here in Natick while yeah, you were she away? Yeah, she came right out of North Natick. Mm -hmm. And uh, some would say to me, you know, in the past few years, talk about marriage and so forth, and someone will say, well, how was your first year of marriage? And I'd say it was great. I was in Korea when she was in South Natick, but she'd get about three feet off the ground and over when she'd sputter. <laughs> <laughs> but that was only kidding. So you were traveling th through Incheon. Yep. And did you establish yourself in one area, or were you moving all the time? Uh, sometimes you'd stay 30, 40 days in an area, and the government figured that if you stay too long in one area, you get uh, relaxed, uh, shiftless, or whatever you want to call it, and you'd make mistakes and you'd get hurt. So we used to shift around every 30 days here or there. We'd go from one area to another area. We'd sometimes we'd stay two months in an area. Then they'd pick us up, total darkness, and away we go. By truck. Sometimes we'd walk. Or you'd walk. All night long. But we didn't have anything to carry but our weapons and ammo, because we had one set of clothes, the ones we were wearing. And in the summertime, it wasn't bad, because you know, you jump in a brook or a river or something, and you'd wash all your clothes, put them right back on while well, you're still standing in the river. But in the wintertime, it was awful hard. You had told me earlier, prior to um, going on tape that you had been involved in um, and around Old Baldy. This is a term that I'm not familiar with, but could you explain that and talk a little more about that? Every hill in Korea has a nickname, mm -hmm. and a GI put it there. And some were called Marilyn Monroe, Betty Grable because of her big friend, 
and you'll see two hills like this, that's Betty Grable. Mm -hmm. And when we started in December, somewhere around there. Now that would be December of 51? Yeah, when mm -hmm. I got there. Uh, I believe I was in, they don't tell you exactly where you are. They give you a map. I got a map there, but it doesn't give you much location. And uh, I think I started out all balding and it had plenty of trees on it, but we pounded it with artillery and mortars and bombs and straked it so much that after a month or two, there was nothing left of it. It was just bald. So I guess they nicknamed it Old Balding. It was one of the high points in that area, and as you well know, whoever owns, owns the high ground has the advantage. Well, we wanted it this week, we took it. And then, don't ask me why, but then we'd walk back off the hill. Nobody around but us. I was with Mortis. I was what they call a forward observer for the infantry most of the time. So I was with the infantry an awful lot of the time. And I just, would I get walk back and there'd be no fight, no nothing, we'd just leave it. Next day, the Chinamen come up the other side, they'd be blowing their horns and trumpet and screaming. There's nobody on it. They thought we were still there. Whether it's psychological or what, I don't know. But anyhow, we pounded it and pounded it and pounded it. And uh, then I went from there what they call the Iron Triangle, which is supposed to be is the gateway to Seoul. That's when I was with the 1st Cavalry Division when I first got there. Do you remember crossing the 38th parallel? No signs. No signs. No signs. So it was just one more road. One more hill. One more hill. Um, and you mentioned fighting the Chinese or coming in contact with the Chinese. Chinese, yes. Was the, were you one of the first groups to? No, 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 no. Uh, they, they, Chinese were in there three, four months before I got there. They were well established. And, and so you knew, were you getting information that they had entered the war, so you were aware of what had been happening? We'd pick up Chinese prisoners every once in a while. They were established by them. Mm -hmm. They were well known, they knew, everybody knew they were there. And uh, when I first went there, it was the North Koreans I was fighting. Then when you shifted different areas, North Koreans had this half and the Chinese had that half or whatever it was, I don't know how they split it up, but they had some million and a half men there. Did you find there were different strategies for fighting the different groups, i.e. The, the North Koreans versus the Chinese? Uh, basically, really not different strategies, basically they're both Asians, they come with, you know, they, they were both the same. You look at two of them, except for the uniform, you could hardly tell the difference. They had a little different quilted uniform. Did they have different? Did they have different strategies that they used? Was one more fearful than the other? You, you know, if it'd be nice and quiet, and then all of a sudden you hear a bugle blowing, something's up. Tonight they wouldn't do nothing. Two or three nights from now, you hear the same bugle playing, and all of a sudden all hell would break loose. Mm -hmm. They didn't. You couldn't quite pinpoint the time when they were going to come, but they weren't going to come. And you'd sit there all night long, kind of worrying. When are they coming? When are they going to, uh, or aren't they going to come? How did you keep up your morale and, the, and your buddies that were with you? How, how did you relax, if you could at all? Uh, there really, there wasn't really that much relaxing. They always had something for you to do to keep your mind occupied. This is a big thing. If you keep the mind occupied, then you didn't worry about other things. And it worked pretty well most of the time. And did you write home often? That was another problem I had. You know, how do you write home and tell your wife and your mother, guy next to you get killed, there was dead Chinese everywhere, four or five Americans got hurt bad. You know, that makes them back here even more, you know, worryable. They worry just that much more. Mm -hmm. So I only had a great today. The sun was out, shot a couple pheasant. They used to shoot, they used to home with a ring neck pheasant. I used to shoot a pheasant once in a while and put it in over the room fire and uh, cook it and went have it for supper, breakfast, dinner, whatever. And you know, I, it was hard to write, how much can you say? 
Uh, just, uh, you just don't write and tell them all the bad points. So you kept a lot in and away from your, your loved Everything ones. Everything I could. Okay. Now my father, I used to write my father quite, you know, once or twice a week. I'd tell him a lot more, but I wouldn't tell my mother my, or my wife. You know, I just, that was out. Were you injured at all while you were over there? Not bad, no. But you were injured? Well, I got blown off a road one day in the wintertime, and I come down landed in the front of my face, and this ice and snow, I got a lot of cuts, but that, that was nothing. So it was nothing that required your going to a hospital? No, 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 no. no, no. Was there a hospital accessible? Yes, there was always hospitals accessible. Was it difficult for you, as you mentioned before, being such a young person, so ill-prepared to see someone who you might have just been talking to suddenly either get severely wounded or killed uh, in combat? It's, well, it's, again, now, it's another feeling that, I don't know how to put it, you have a, a guilt feeling. This guy got hurt, well, why didn't I protect him? I should have been paying more attention to what he was doing uh, uh, what direction he was being going in, and so forth, and so on. You know, and all of a sudden you say, "Well, geez, he's protected me. Why wasn't he watching out for me?" You know, and then, then you go back and forth in your mind and say, "Well, if he had been with me, he wouldn't have got hurt. Now, if I had been with him, maybe I would have got killed too." And it, it goes back and forth, and it gives you a weird feeling in the bottom of your stomach. But it's, it's something you learn to live with. Were you able to keep in contact with any of the um, other soldiers that you had been living with for almost three years in some cases? Two Very three no. Years? I don't know, probably a four or five, that's it. Mm -hmm. What do you feel were some of your greatest challenges while you were in combat? Uh, easy, living. <laughs> breathing today and breathing tomorrow. Just staying alive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Were you forced to withdraw from any battles that you fought? And if so, were they orderly or was it pretty disorganized? Uh, I don't know what you'd want to call a battle now. We'd go out on patrol at night and we'd fight the soul and then we'd withdraw automatically. It was all arranged. We just wanted to harass, probably, I don't know. Maybe we wanted to find out what was up on the hill, whether they were heavily fortified or just a half a dozen of them. As soon as we, uh, the little guy, he isn't told all of this, and he just does what he's told. And all, you know, I'd go up as an FO, and if they got in a bad fight, I'd had a radio, I'd call back to my mortar company, platoon, and I'd order in a uh, round of mortar, or half a dozen, or whatever, and uh, then we could get out, and would be oddly enough, I and mean, we wouldn't leave nobody behind. It was. I would say it was fairly, most of it was oddly, because it was all coordinated two or three days in advance, and they did the best they could to keep it that way. You mentioned the little guy, I'm assuming that's you. Were you a private at that time, or a specialist, or? No, I was a corporal. Corporal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Were you aware of um, some of the senior officials, such as General Ridgeway or Walker? Had you heard about? Ridgeway taking over because Walker apparently was killed in an accident. Yeah, that comes through on the Stars and Stripes. It's a little army newspaper. Right. And you get quite a bit out of it. Matter of fact, my name got in it once. Was it a positive reason? Oh, yeah. And what was that? Well, I come across an old Russian truck and it had a heater in it, so I grabbed the heater out of it. The rest of the truck is all gone. And it was a little fan. Then I had my bunker. I got some pipe put up to the top of my bunker and I had an air-conditioned hooch. <laughs> Probably one of the few over there. Yep. So you got this information through the Stars and Stripes. Yeah. Did you feel that it would directly affect you when something like that happened, when there was a change in command? No. Mm -hmm. just, the, the, the poor infantrymen still had to do the fighting, no matter who the general was. The fighting is still the same. What about with uh, General MacArthur? Had you heard any um, information about him or any attitudinal changes about him? You know, you always get these rumors. The Army has rumors like there's no tomorrow, the Marine Corps, yeah, they all have them. And you wonder, and then the Stars and Stripes would come out, then you'd read it. Whatever they wanted you to know. And did you believe everything that you read in the Stars and Stripes? 
sometimes it was kind of difficult, but it was supposed to be the truth. I mean, there was some high command changes, and I'll give you 100 to 1 odds, they, it was political. Mm -hmm. And how long were you in Korea? Uh, I went in, in November, uh, September, first November in that area somewhere, and I come out, I think, in August of the following year, in 52. During that time period, did you have any time off at all? Uh, I had what you really call time off. I had five days in Japan. I was there oh, six, six, probably seven months. And then you got flown back by the Army, free of charge, to three major cities in Japan. And they gave you five days, and you hop back on the plane, and they drive you back up again to fly you back to Korea. So taking five days to go to another Asian country that you weren't familiar with, and it's not an English-speaking country, did you enjoy your five days away? Yes. Did I you was, go with a group? Well, there was two other fellows from my company. Uh, there was three of us went together. And you'd always meet somebody else. Mm -hmm. Always start talking, another GI, another way we go. Was Japan in a state that you could freely roam or was it the type of atmosphere that you had difficulty in going to certain areas, even for simple sightseeing? Uh, we had, I had no difficulty going anywhere, but I was told, when you go into their hotels in those days, I don't know if it's the same or not now, but you always took off your shoes. Never leave them outside. You tied the two strings together, put them all around your neck, and you could take your shoes with you, because mm -hmm. they're a prized item. Mm -hmm. And you'd come out after two or three hours somewhere, you know, and the next thing you know, your shoes are gone. Kind of hard, you know, to tell the supplies that and what happened to your shoes. And you don't have them anymore. So in August, you left Korea. Some in the middle of August, if I'm not mistaken. And where were you sent from there? Uh, I went from, I, I, I got a boat in Seoul, uh, Incheon, and we motored down to that large city in southern Japan that had that earthquake two years ago. Mm -hmm. There's a Navy base there. So we got in there and uh, we were, whatever you want to call it, there was probably a thousand of us in a big field, guy up in a pulpit. I had my duffel bag, nothing good in it. and. Uh, Side and says, all right, fellas, put your duffel bag to your left side, take all your clothes off and put them on the right side. The only thing you'll have with you is your wallet. Did you ever see 15, 12, 14, 1500 men with no, not even stockings on? We walked us through showers, we come out the other end, they clothed us, and away we went. So I went, took my duffel bag. Don't ask me how they cleared that field of duffel bags. 20 minutes, there was a thousand duffel bags, gone. Never seen them again. Of course, a lot of fellows had contraband in them. Stuff they wanted to bring home, you know, little things they pick up. You know, all the rear echelon got to take that stuff home. Then they could brag about it. So you were all cleaned up, spit and polished, yeah. and then put on planes? Uh, no, I got on a boat. Merchant Marines took me back. Navy took me over. They tried to drown me. <laughs> I don't like the Navy no more. But the, the Richard Marines coming back, uh, me and that corporal plate that lady I was talking to, for, uh, he, uh, two of us went into the plumbing department and says, you need help coming back. And they said, yeah, we need two followers. Well, here you got them. Well, I didn't know anything about plumbing, never did. But anyhow, <laughs> it gets you out of the chow line. It gets you out of sleeping, whatever. And you know, in the morning, the sergeant come around, wake everybody up. I had a tag in my thing, it says plumber, helper, whatever it was. That eliminated me from getting up at five in the morning. I could stay up till nine. Go to the plumbing shop. The plumber would say, do you eat breakfast? Nope, come on down with us. We go down to the Marine Department, where the Merchant Marines were and we'd eat with the Merchant Marines. 
Then they gave you a menu. I never had a menu in a whole year. And you name it, it was all there. You can have any kind of bacon and eggs, sausage and eggs, ham and eggs, you take it. It's all right there. You just say to the, and uh, so we went up to the plumbing shop the first day and the guy says to me, you know anything about plumbing? Nope. Turn the faucet, water comes out. <laughs> That's all I know. Well, anyhow, you just take this wrench and the rope, look smart, and I'll see you at four o'clock. That was it. I did that for about 15 days coming home. Didn't do a blasted thing. Roamed the whole ship, because that little tag I had gave me the right to go there. Someone said, what are you doing? I'm checking out the plumbing. <laughs> mm -hmm. right, Where did you ship into then, New York or? No, I went into uh, San Francisco, mm -hmm. under the Golden Gate, just at daylight. Was that an emotional homecoming for you? Certainly was. Yeah. What were some of your most memorable exper experiences? Like what? You tell me. Something that the just... The day a sergeant and I, at 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night, we had been shelled, lost communications with the rear, and ran in like the devil. So the first sergeant chase communications back and get us back in contact with the company, headquarters. All right, away we went. And him being a sergeant, me being a corporal, he led the way. Well, anyhow, we had a thump. Someone just jumped off the bank and arms right ahead of us. Who is it? Lord, I tell you, I was so scared, I could have crawled under a helmet, and you wouldn't even see my shoes. We laid in that mud all night long. The next morning, it got daylight, and guess what? Every once in a while, a big hunk of mud would fly, clonk. We laid in the mud all night long, we didn't know what it was. Did we get harassed for the next two weeks? So you didn't know if it was a, I, we didn't a know friend, what it was. an but enemy, sound, he, 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 an both animal? Both of us were someone jumping off the bank and off the, off the dirt road. What about a, a humorous experience? Two of us in a foxhole one night, doing Prima to God. And we heard someone out in the rice paddy splashing around, and I said, <laughs> what do you think? He says, well, the other guy said, someone coming. I had two flare grenades, you know, four or five hand grenades, and I loaded them one. And I said, I know what I'm going to do first. And he says, well, I don't care what you do, we got to do something. I had three, two flare grenades in the air before they even went off, and I had two fragments ready to go, and guess what? There's a mountain lion out there catching frogs. Scared. He's still running. <laughs> I don't think he ever slowed down. We shook for two days afterwards. Then another night, my houseboy, his name was Pack and Sue. He had been shot three times by North, uh, the, either North Koreans, or he don't know which, but they cut him over on the side here, another one in here, another one down here. And they patched him up. <clears throat> How so old he was, was he? 12, 10, 12 years old. And one night the commander says, we need a new line back to company. All right. So way we went, got halfway back. I cranked the phone up, hooked up the line to company. I says, Kim, you talk. Well, he talked in Korean. And all of a sudden, the only thing reaction back at company, they were being invaded by the Chinese. <laughs> and their company went on full alert all night long. <laughs> it was my houseboy that I ne I never said a word. I says, Kim, you say anything and I'm going to shoot you for a Chinaman. <laughs> oh, I tell you, that kid and I were, he was one of the greatest kids you ever wanted to see. Are you ever curious as to what he's doing now? Yes. I have talked to the Korean Embassy in Boston and they can't help me. I have his picture and I have some writing. It's in that book over there. And uh, he was a comical kid. Nothing ever fazed him. His mother and father were in North Korea as prisoners of war. I tried through the Red Cross to get him out. I even sent him like 500 American dollars. That wasn't enough. I was broke. I couldn't go any higher. So I lost that deal. And you know, he'd go to Seoul and I'd give him $5 in paper money because we only had paper. We didn't have regular American money. It was all paper money called script. And, uh, he knew everybody down there. He could speak the language and so forth. And I said, bring back squid. Well, right along. Uh, octopus. And they'd salt it down. 
and hanging up on the side of a building that would just like shoe leather. Uh, you chew on that stuff like chewing tobacco, chew it for a while, tasteless, then you spit it out and bit off another piece. He'd bring me back three or four of those every time he'd go to, once a month he'd go to Seoul, sometimes twice a month. I had a little pass made up for him that was signed by the company commander. It was, I, I had all his clothes, all GI clothes, helmet. I even got him a weapon. That was completely illegal. If they ever found, some of them ever found out about that, we'd both been shot over there. But we got along great. The only place that would not take him was out on patrols. He was too young. I couldn't see that kid going out on patrol. He had been through enough. So he used to stay back at platoon. And how long kid. was he with you? Almost a year. When I left, the, uh, another outfit took him over. And I understand they gave him an awful hard time. They said he stole, he did this, he did that. That kid never took a dime. You had a trusting relationship with him. Oh, uh, all the way. You could not for a better kid. And then when were you discharged from the service? Where? When and where? Uh, Fort Devens on November 2nd, 1953. So when you returned through California, did you come back to Fort Devens? Uh, they put us on a plane in Oakland, and they flew us to uh, Boston. And it took 24 hours to about 24 hours and 10 minutes to fly. And it was an old DC-3. And I swear to God, those wings were going up and down like an old crow. <laughs> oh, boy, what a ride. We never made over 500 feet off the ground. You could see the tree branches going by us sometimes. Oh, what a ride. But it's all they had in those days. Then what was it like coming back to family and friends in your native community? Uh, it was a little strange at first. You know, you didn't know just what to do, how to act. You know, it was, when you get stuck with men all the time and it was the way it was, it's, it was a change in life again. It was bad as going over. Coming back was almost as bad. I uh, <clears throat> got into Devons and another, I don't know who he is, from Framingham. Come back on the same airplane. I didn't know who was from, he was from Framingham. Anyhow, between the two of us, we scraped enough money up to get to Framingham by taxi. Oh, I had a brilliant idea. I said to the taxi cab driver, do you would ever drive down through Natick? Oh, yeah. I said, would you, would you take me down to Natick? No, nope, your money ran out. I says, my father's the policeman in Natick, and if you ever get caught in Natick, you'll be arrested. I don't care what you do. Yeah, I'll take you to Natick, no problems. <laughs> He's delivering right to the police station over here. Did your family know you were coming home? Uh, my father knew I was coming home within a two-week period, because you never can tell how the government acts. And uh, <clears throat> I went to the police station. I knew most of the policemen. How about the crews that are going to South Natick? No problem, Don, right in. The crews took me right down to the house, four o'clock in the morning. I walked in the house, the back door was open, the kitchen light is on, walked in. My wife was laying in bed, sound asleep, snoring like she usually does. I says, do you mind if I lay on top of the covers? Took my shoes off, she says, nope. All of a sudden, she realized who was there. She went crazy. Anyhow, Come, I don't know, seven o'clock. My mother got up. My wife was out making coffee. Oh, my sister, don't tell her anything. She turned around, look out the window, and I touched her on the shoulder, and here I am. She turned white in your bluffs. She didn't know what to do. Very emotional for her, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Hey, I'm safe. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, I stayed. I stayed around the house most of the day. And that was on a Wednesday or Thursday. My wife said, I got good news for you when I got discharged. I got a job for you. Wonderful. Let me serve the rest of the, the year. I got coming first, will you? So anyhow, uh, the two of us went to Fort Riley, Kansas. Fort? Fort Riley, Kansas. Riley, yep. okay. I stayed out there, I don't know, six, seven months, and I got a, uh, a hardship discharge back to Natick. Because? A hardship transfer, I should say. My mother was real sick. Mm -hmm. So they transferred me to uh, 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 Devon's up here. And then they temporarily duty, they put me down the Cape, Wellfleet. I spent the whole summer on the beach. 
clap on the now it's take time. They had, they had uh, you know the Marconi wireless station is? Yes, Marconi. All uh, right, that's mm -hmm. where I was, right there. It was a National Guard training base for a while for any aircraft. But I had the best job in the house. I ran the, yeah, the post gas station, two of us. Another fellow, little Frenchman named Marchand. And he lived in Buzz's Bay. So he'd go home for a whole week and I'd take care of the gas station. He'd come in, he'd take care of the gas, and I'd go home for a week. And finally, it, it, it caught up with us. You're only supposed to take every other day off. The old man, the company commander, didn't appreciate that at all. So then you came back and you were getting out of the service. Your wife had a job lined up for you. Did you take that job? Yep. And what was that? New England concrete pipe. <laughs> Making concrete pipe down in Needham. And how long did you work with them? Oh, I don't know, seven or eight months. Come spring, I uh, had a job back in construction again with D.M. Bernardi. Then I got laid off one fall, two or three years later, and someone says to me, come to work with me. So it was a private contractor here in Natick. So I went to work for him in Caswell Construction in South Natick. Mm -hmm. And uh, went to work with him, and he says, you know, can't keep working all the time, so then I went to work for the town, water and sewer division. And how long did you work for that department? Seven years. And did you retire from there? No, I quit. And then I went to business myself. In construction or? No, you see a big blue truck running around here. Don Scott cesspool service. Mm -hmm. That was my business for uh, 20 years. Looking back in current day, quite often the Korean War is spoken of as the Forgotten War. Yeah. Do you feel that the veterans f felt then and do now that it was the Forgotten War? Do you see any changes in attitude about that war? No. When you spend, I've got over something like 200 and some odd days in combat. You don't forget those days. They're hard. It teaches you a lot. And you don't forget it, because you learn it the hard way. And a veteran like that would, any of these veterans that come home, they don't forget things like that. It's something that's in the mind, and it's there forever. And uh, I think the government is shortchanging veterans left and right. I don't think it's fair, but no, that's what you have to get when you believe your Uncle Sam. Do you feel, well this is a question that we've asked a number of the veterans that we have interviewed prior to this interview today. Do you feel that there's a difference of the public opinion regarding the World War II veterans, the Korean veterans, and those who served in Vietnam? And do you feel that that attitude is changing at all? The World War II veteran now is, to say, a, a scarce item. There's not many of them left. They're disappearing very rapidly. and. They have their problems. They don't forget them, like, just like any other veteran. And it was a different type of whatever you want to call it. The war was the same, but their recognition is altogether different. You had USO shows. You had uh, USO canteens everywhere you went. Uh, there was always entertainment for them. And that didn't happen during the Korean War. Uh, I went once to a US, USO show, that was it, once. No movies, no nothing. The show lasted about an hour. There was about six priests and clergymen down the front row, and uh, they sat there for, say, a half an hour, and then someone said to them, well, it's time to leave, Father. They all got up and left like gentlemen, and then, oh my God. That's when it, they, they tuned it up a little. <laughs> Preacher's not supposed to hear them kind of jokes. But I don't think they went too far. They probably sat up in the back row somewhere. Because they're human too, and they had the same problems we did. When you were, were, when you were fighting in Korea, um, did you have a real sense that you, as an American soldier, were fighting communism? No, I didn't have that really. 
Or did you ever have any doubts about the mission that, that the Americans... I've had, I had a lot of doubts about some of the things we did. Then, as much as now? Uh, I understand them more now because I know why. We were told to do things and there was no... No, uh, they didn't tell us why they were doing it or anything else. We just did it. But now you look back in history and you, you, you see why they did this. Mm -hmm. And you didn't understand it all because I was one of the oldest followers in my outfit, 22 years old. And I couldn't figure out half what was going on. They said, you go out with a patrol, I went out with a patrol. Mm -hmm. They get in trouble, I call back for support from my company, from my platoon rather. And you know, things like this, it's just, we go out and you come back in the dark. You go out in the dark and you come back in the daylight. What do you think is the biggest misunderstanding that most American people have about the Korean War? The people themselves. The biggest item I get so upset with, and some say, oh, that was one of the good wars. And I, my reply is, um, stupid, did you ever see a good war? There's no such thing as a good war. Uh, what most people don't understand, you look at the total dead in World War II, it's up in the thousands and thousands, it, they did a better job. Well, can you tell me, United Nations was the list that everybody went under. It wasn't an American war, it wasn't a Canadian war, it was the United Nations war. Can you tell me how many United Nations soldiers died? No. Over 600,000. You don't hear these figures, but you heard it all in World War II. All you hear is what we lost, 54,000. And most people don't realize we still got two or 3,000 prisoners that have never been accounted for. Mm -hmm. And we never will find them. They're gone. I hate to say this, but they're gone. Until you get into it and see how a man can disappear. You wouldn't believe it. If I told you I watched a medic disappear off the side of a hill, just disappeared, instantly, not two days, three days, within a hundredth of a second, he disappeared. A shell came in and landed right in him. He just disintegrated. Now how do you bring that back? Hmm. You don't. There's no way of finding him. He went up in smoke. And things like this, you know, and I don't know. They found a World War II soldier, you know, a couple of years, a year, year and a half ago in France, still sitting behind his machine gun. Farmer was cutting brush. He went into a bunch, a little bunch of bushes. And there he is. He's still laying. He numbered a skeleton. His clothes were there, and they identified him with his dog tags. Of course, he's well dead, but these things do happen. Mm -hmm. How important was serving in the military to you? Uh, it was important two different ways. It smartened me up a lot. I got to see the country. I got to see some of the world. Uh, I learned a little bit about other people, how they live, where they live, you know, what they did for a lifestyle. And, you know, then it also taught me that I did something good for my country. I'm proud of it. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people say you shouldn't be because it's the wrong way to be proud. I mean, yeah, well, it's the way I feel about it. I'm happy about it. I did my little bit, and someone says to me, ah, oh, up at the Kennedy, up at the Cole Center the other day, we had that, that dedication. There was a soccer game broke up on the other side, and the parents, these kids weren't this big. These women, and a couple of fellas, they were dedicating, they were playing the national anthem, and they were all saluting the flag like they're supposed to, with all the, the firemen that were there and the veterans, and this lady, beep, beep, get out of my way, I want to go home. She didn't have the the respect to sit there two or three minutes till the national anthem stopped. Yeah, I, I, I was furious. This was but. the dedication of the Robert Cole and Robert yeah. Cole Jr. And I think when the father Center. and the son both get killed in the line of duty, you should have some respect for the family and the two of them. Mm -hmm. Lady, beep, 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 let me out. I'm all through playing soccer. One of the firemen says, Lady, I'm saluting the flag. You're not getting through. She says, I'm going to run over your hose. And the fireman says, if you do, you're in big, deep, you know what? And she sat there, shut the engine off. She was scared to go over the hose. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, it's these stupid little things that I get so mad about. Mm -hmm. 
I get furious. Knowing that it, it was an important duty that you did, as you said, it taught you a lot. Um, how do you feel that it affected the rest of your life? Well, it gave me a sense that life right now is, is a valuable commodity. Once you lose it, it's all gone. And uh, I respect a lot of things that I knew nothing about before such as other people's rights. Everybody has a right. I had my rights, I wanted to join, I joined. And I, uh, I have a lot more respect for a lot more things that go on in different places, different ways. Is there one thought, as we wrap this up, is there one thought, one comment, one memory that you would like to share, not only with your family who will see this tape, but also with the community and other future generations down the road who will be viewing this tape at some point in time? No, not really. Just it's, I like to see people respect a veteran a little more than they do. Because he's done more than the average person to keep this country the way it is now. And like I told one guy, I says, you know, well, I should say guy, husband and wife, they were complaining and complaining. And I says, you know, it wasn't for a veteran, you might be talking Japanese or German right about now. Then what would you do? In the conversation, they left. I hurt their feelings, I think. It didn't bother me in the least. I think, you know, uh, the veterans should be respected, not put on a pedestal. They're still human, but they should see a little more respect than what they're getting. Congress has taken away this, taken away that, you name everything. That just, I was promised a lot of little things, you know, when I first joined. They're all gone now. I can go to a veterans hospital, I'm at the end of the line. I used to take a follow-in two, three days a week because he had cancer. I took him in Boston. There were Asians ahead of him that were never in the military service. They were just helpers in Vietnam. They were civilians. They got back to the... They were in line first. This fellow I took in, he spent 21 years in the service. He was in World War II. He was on the front lines when Korea first broke out. I'm wearing his shoes. He was at the end of the line. This isn't fair. Our hospitals right now got more Asians. Not that I get anything against an Asian now, but just that whatever nation they come from, they're ahead of the, the American soldier, which I don't think is fair. Don, Scott, we would like to thank you for interviewing with us this afternoon. And we would look forward to other interviews similar to yours. We've really enjoyed this. I hope you've enjoyed it too. Thank you very much. You're more than welcome. Anytime.